Okay, hey folks, um, this is on the Linux kernel random number generator, uh, known as random.c. Um, doesn't don't know me, I'm Jason Donenfeld, the x 4 online. Mainly I do security stuff, some crypto stuff, but been doing kernel development for a long time. Been working on WireGuard the last couple of years where random, number gener random numbers play a really important role in, uh, in the crypto. So this year I've put a lot of work into trying to improve the Linux random number generator. Um, so just some, some background, the Linux random number generator, uh, it's in random.c, which is really old code. It dates back, as far as I could find, to version 1.3.30. I mean, it's really ancient code. There's a copyright date on it from 1994. So I think that even the code was living someplace else before there. Um, but actually, considering when it was written, it's not so bad. Uh, it's held up remarkably well, uh, despite the knowledge that was around in that time. Um, and I think for all intents and purposes, it's, it's okay, it's held up, it's been done with, uh, with some reasonable intelligence, but um, still over time, there's been a lot of complexity added to it. Uh, so there's different code styles, old code styles and weird types. Um, it looks strange. Um, and there's also been a lot of conflicting ideas about what the goals are for it, um, what the various semantics have been and over time, these ideas have changed, as ideas do, um, but kind of in one, one code base. And so things have gotten a little bit jumbled. Um, but, it, you know, most engineering projects are like that. It's practical code that needs to uh, live and work and deal with the, the challenges of the time. And so it's evolved, uh, but it's old. Um, so just to give you some old idea, um, that, an example, at some point, there were some uh, performance concerns um, that led to replacing uh, MD5 uh, with, an, with a linear feedback shift register, um, so like some linear function. Um, now, interestingly, the original notion of using MD5 as a cryptographic hash, actually a pretty good idea. Uh, it wasn't known at the time that MD5 was broken, but as an idea, this was uh, kind of a started out nice. But at some point, this LFSR was introduced instead and then tweaked over the years. Um, and then LFSRs were kind of added all over the place at different points in time for different purposes, uh, which in some sense are fine, but also we can do better just by using a, a good hash function these days. Um, so uh, when I first saw this, the mixed pool bytes, the question is like, what, what is this code doing? Um, but then my next thought was actually, can I break it or do some funny business with it without even thinking about what it is, without having to use my brain? So um, I hooked it up to an SMT solver. Uh, rather than having to think, uh, I, I wrote that same code in PYZ3 that can output SMT2 code. And then I gave it to Boolector, which is a super powerful SMT solver. Um, and then I gave the pool some inputs uh, to control its state. And the question is, uh, can I give it some more inputs to, to zero out the state or to do something nasty to it? Um, now, there's some question of what that attack even corresponds to, like what security model that really makes a difference. But just wanted to see like how, how malleable is this without actually having to think about the code. And so, you know, that's Python Z3 like stuff. And it looks pretty much like the C. Um, and I put that in the SMT solver and then it, it spit out an answer really fast. So that was cool without even thinking about the code um, and what it's doing, I could get SMT to solve it for me, which is you know probably not good for how malleable it is, but it's LFSR, which means it's a linear function. So with some linear algebra, uh, you can just kind of solve it immediately um, because really what's happening with, with that big code is you have some, uh, some matrix A and a state vector S, and you multiply the state by the matrix, and then you add in your new input, and that gives you the new state. Um, and because A, the matrix is linear, um, uh, you can invert it, and so you can move forward and backwards, and it's really a super malleable thing. Um, and so a, a magma uh, linear algebra tool could solve the rest uh, just, as, just as easy. Um, but this whole thing about LFSR has reminded me, um, in open, 
BSD. Um, there's some curious stuff. Uh, a long time ago, the Linux LFSR was selectable. Um, so you could choose how big you wanted it to be, uh, how much state, with the biggest one being like eight kilobytes of state, which is pretty huge. Um, and at some point, Linux did away with that. But at another point, Linux added this twist table, um, which is like an extension field on the CRC32 polynomial, um, which was added for kind of more strange reasons that were relevant during the time they were added, but that maybe aren't, aren't so much so now. Um, and so that's some old Linux code showing, uh, showing the old polynomials and the old code. And then um, there was an open BSD. It's like the same code. It's like they copy and pasted it and just chose the biggest polynomial. Um, and then they also used that CRC32 uh, twist table uh, as well. Um, but there's a problem, which is that um, even though the polynomial is primitive in its own, uh, it's not when used in that CRC32 extension field, uh, which means we can just factor it. Um, so I've typed it up in Magma. We, there's the extension field, and then we have a polynomial ring, and then we factor them together, and bam, we get the factors that come out of it, which shows it's not primitive. In fact, there's like a X to the 31 term in there, um, which means there's some pretty small cycles. So maybe this means uh, you can fix the open BSD random number generator in, in place, only giving a, a couple values. I don't know, but, but not good. Anyway, this is just to kind of indicate that with these old things like AlphaSars, there's a lot of mischief you can do. It's, uh, uh, it, maybe it serves some goals at one point, but like nowadays, why don't, why don't we just use a cryptographic hash function? Um, so th there's kind of all sorts of things like this that were interesting considerations at one point in time in the Linux RNG code, but now we can do a lot better with just kind of simpler things. Um, uh, but I, all things considered, the old code was fine, but we can simplify and improve it. So let's talk about, um, let's talk about how things work now um, and how we got there. So there have been a couple attempts at kind of wholesale replacement at the Linux RNG, um, except massive replacement uh, generally isn't how Linux development is done. Uh, you know, it's difficult to review, people's feathers get ruffled. Um, uh, and so the approach I took over this last year is uh, more incremental where every change I make is a, a small change with a highly documented commit. Um, and I've done a lot of code archeology, span everything I've changed, I wanted to know exactly why the original code was, was that way, what's the history behind it. Um, so that it, everything's incremental, but it's also robust. I'm not just throwing things out because I don't understand, ah, what's this, get rid of it. No, I really want to understand why it's there before changing it. Um, um, but it's been a big project. It's been 147 commits. And if you just look at the commit messages for those, uh, that is since December of last year, it's like uh, 18,000 words of just explanation and googly gawk. Um, but as a result, random.c is pretty small now, it's 900 something lines of code uh, and almost 500 lines of comments. Uh, so it's, getting smaller and more manageable. And uh, the goal is for it to be secure and robust while also looking trivial, approachable, not really a big complicated thing. Um, all right, let's dive in. There are several components um, of how this works. And so we'll start with entropy collection. Uh, so we mentioned the LFSR, but now we just use Blake 2S, which is a fast cryptographic hash function. Um, it's fast on uh, all sorts of different CPUs. Um, and it, it's cool, it can act in a hash mode, um, like a traditional hash function, or a PRF mode, uh, which is like HMAC or something similar to that, where it's a hash function that takes a key. Um, and internally, Blake basically just hashes that key as a first block separately uh, to have some domain separation. But it's nice to, to think of it sometimes as a PRF like that. Um, so when we get these inputs from various entropy sources, uh, instead of all this LFSR stuff, we just call Blake 2S update. Uh, and we're just constantly hashing things in, which is you know, basic and dumb, but there's a good amount of literature that shows that cryptographic hash functions, computational hash functions like this are, are good at collecting, storing entropy. Um, and 
a hash function is not like a super malleable structure. Um, there's not a lot of mischief you can do with it. Um, so entropy extraction. So the old code uh, called SHA-1 on the LFSR pool, uh, but then it didn't use the whole SHA-1. It actually XORed one half with the other half, which is kind of the same as truncating it cryptographically. Um, which actually, in theory, that's all fine. It only needed to be non-invertible. And maybe you get something against attacks by truncation like that. Um, I mean, come on, SHA-1. Sh it shouldn't be anywhere in, in, in the kernel at this point. Um, so what we do now is uh, first we generate a block of RD RAND uh, or RDC, whatever is available, as a salt. And I'll talk more about how this is used later. Uh, but really, this is just an additional input that um, that we can use, um, and we generate it outside of locks this way. Um, so we finalize the hash. Uh, this gives us some 32-byte uh, output. Um, and then we do two more Blake calls where we use that output as the key for each one. Um, and the input is the RDC block plus one or the RDC block plus zero. And then this gives us two outputs. Um, the first output then initializes Blake 2S for uh, the next uh, collection of entropy so that we carry forward in some way the old state to the new state. And then the extracted data is that second output. Um, okay, entropy expansion. So once we get an output from, uh, from Blake, we have this 32 byte uh, seed, and then we can give it to ChaCha20 and expand this out indefinitely. ChaCha20 is a stream cipher, so you give it some 256 bit key, it's 32 bytes, um, and then you just get super long stream of whatever. Um, and that's the output that the, that the user sees. Uh, but one goal we have is that the RNG is, uh, uh, this is, uh, has forged secrecy. So if at some point uh, an attacker compromises the system, you don't want them to be able to then look at all the random numbers that were returned in the past. Um, and so usually with something like ChaCha20, you have a key and then like a, a counter for which block it is. And uh, so if the, you know, if the counter is 16 now and you wanted to figure out what was it when it was one, you can just wind the counter back. Uh, which is bad for force secrecy. So with this fast key erasure uh, RNG idea, we take the first 32 bytes of the output every time we use it to overwrite that key so that then you can't go back. Uh, so very simple, easy to implement thing, um, and it, it gets the job done there. Um, another goal, though, is, is speed. Um, the... Uh, the entropy collection, there's one pool because entropy is, you know, maybe rare, relatively rare. We don't want to have a, a pool per CPU. So we collect everything in one place. We get one seed out of it. Um, but when we're actually giving numbers to the user, we don't want to be uh, waiting on locks. We don't want there to be contention, especially on, uh, on, on multiple NUMA nodes and all that. So uh, there's a per CPU cha-cha instance. Um, so uh, the way this works is we have one base cha-cha instance, and this is kind of giving out seeds that go to each CPU. And then each CPU operates on its own, uh, so it doesn't need to take any locks. Um, and uh, this yields uh, huge performance improvements. Um, OK, entropy sources. Um, there are a couple ways to add things to the RNG. Um, add device randomness uh, is used for any inputs that might have some randomness, but might not. We don't really know. Um, so, for example, uh, DMI tables. Uh, recently, there was a patch that was very cool to, uh, to call add device randomness on the serial numbers from SD cards and, and MMC cards. Um, on some embedded devices, maybe that serial number is the only non-deterministic thing they have. Now it's, you know, it's still fixed once it's there, but hey, it's something. And depending on the, the threat model, maybe that something's the best thing you got. Um, the only thing distinguishing, you know, one embedded device from another. So maybe that's useful, but maybe it's not, it doesn't matter. You can just call add device randomness on it. 
and it won't get worse. Uh, you know, same thing for USB serial numbers, MAC addresses, even wall clock and wall clock changes. Uh, it can't hurt. Uh, and so if you're a driver writer and you think that your device you're running a driver for might have some bit of information that's maybe random or maybe unique or maybe secret or whatever, um, feel free to just add a call to add device running the CC me on the patch because I'm curious about it, but uh, it really can't hurt to do this. Uh, unless you know you're calling in a loop super fast all the time or something, but otherwise, uh, this is something that I think can really help on embedded systems, particularly. Uh, there's one for uh, hardware random number generators. Um, so there's a whole HWRNG framework, uh, which is a bit messy, but from random.c's perspective, um, it doesn't matter. It just hands random C some bytes um, and some indication of how much entropy is in those bytes and adds it. Um, it just broke the lectern, oops, there we go. Um, anyway, it's a private interface between the hardware RNG and random.c. Um, so don't use it from your own code, but interesting to know we have this hardware random number generator framework. So for uh, various pieces of physical hardware that know they have real randomness, uh, we can plug that into. Um, Add bootloader randomness is uh, an important one um, and one that I'd like to see a lot more usage. Uh, right now it's used by device tree, EFI, a couple other things. And it gets a random seed from the bootloader or from early firmware. Um, and it runs hopefully super early when Linux boots up. Um, like in some cases uh, uh, before this, the slabs have even been randomized. Um, so it really gets a, a, a super early seed. So DTB, uh, device tree based systems can pass this through a property called uh, RNG seed. Um, EFI sometimes has a capability of, um, of generating a seed itself, which is neat, um, uh, using whatever random number generators are available to EFI or a TPM or whatever is plugged into that. Um, but also um, we're working now to hook this up with system deboot, um, which has its own management of seed files where it can pass along a seed through the various EFI chains and at each level we'll hash it with whatever is available at that level. Um, uh, in 6.0, uh, the x86 setup data um, uh, linked list has a thing so that we can pass things over on kexec, which is neat, uh, but also QMU uh, should be able to pass it soon um, when you start it with uh, dash kernel, so that when you start up test kernels, it immediately has a random C to work with. Uh, even for M68K for virtual devices, these are usually really deterministic, uh, but now QMU supports it, the kernel does too. There's a little uh, boot protocol so we can uh, pass random Cs that way. Um, and UML, of course, can call get random because it's running as a as a user process. Um, and so from random.c's perspective, uh, these all just call into it by saying add bootloader randomness. Um, uh, and so if anyone's working on a weird arc that's usually is not very noisy or has problems with randomness, this is a great way to add, uh, add, add a hook. If you find something in the firmware or something you can use. Um, just talk on this yesterday, so I won't, going too much, but um, we also try to deal with uh, VM forks, that is when a virtual machine is snapshotted or uh, when it forks into two or when it's rewound. Um, we still want uh, VMs to have uh, some non-determinism, um, which is sort of contrary to the whole snapshotting idea. Um, and so there's something called VM gen ID where uh, the hypervisor can provide a unique ID and a signal to the VM that something's changed. Um, uh, these are some oldies. Um, there's add input randomness. So things improve when you like jiggle your mouse around, uh, which is like very kind of naive, but it works. Um, handles auto repeat, like if you hold down a key with just like a static variable. Uh, so it's naive, but it gets the job done. Um, add disk randomness for the disk rotations. Um, and we'll talk a little bit 
about later about uh, entropy estimation. Um, but so both of these use some of the oldest current surviving code from the original random.c uh, that, that's still there. Um, the important aspect though is um, the main input for these, even though it, you know, it takes the, the button you press on the keyboard or some aspect of your mouse, the, actually the real primary input is a cycle counter uh, that uses this function random get entropy. Uh, so on x86 it's RDTSC and on other platforms it's whatever the fastest but also highest resolution cycle counter we can get is or some other type of monotonic counter. Um, let's talk about this in a second. Uh, but similarly, um, <clears throat> uh, the interrupt handler also is taking these cycle counters and this is probably the, the primary most important source of entropy we have in the kernel. Um, uh, uh, it's triggered more often on most platforms, um, but also it runs in hard IRQ context so, uh, uh, context, so it needs to be fast. So we have something called a fast mix function that doesn't give it to the main pool immediately. Uh, it kind of buffers it for a bunch of IRQs and then eventually um, sets a, a work queue to handle it. Um, so the input at each interrupt is two longs, and the goal is to compress it down to a state composed of four longs. Um, and so the thing we have now is based on uh, SIP hash, uh, but in sort of a sponge construction. Uh, seems to work. Uh, it, there's some half decent cryptographic argument behind it. Uh, it's not as robust as I'd like it to be, so currently exploring using different sponges for this. Um, kind of concerning, it, it, the fast mix function used to be a custom add rotate XOR permutation from an anonymous contributor named George Spelvin. Um, and anytime you have someone rolling totally hand brewed crypto, um, especially anonymous identity, I mean, be wary. Um, and indeed, it's not really a great ARX. It doesn't doesn't achieve its goal. But uh, over the years, George Spelvin, this anonymous contributor, has made all sorts of kind of awesome things. His mailing list posts are fascinating. I kind of love the guy. I think he's disappeared in past years. But if you're out there, George, somewhere, get in touch. I'd love to talk to you, but I have no idea who you are. Your email doesn't work anymore. I don't know, but if you're out there, please find me. Um, Okay, let's talk about this uh, random get entropy function. On, on most platforms, it expands to get cycles. Um, on some, it expands to something specific. So like old MIPS are weird. Um, and we, on some MIPS have to combine two different things. Uh, but ultimately, if it can't find anything, it'll fall back to the raw monotonic counter that timekeeping knows about, which is sometimes slow. But this is the primary input material to the RNG. It's, it's really important that this be high resolution. Um, so if you're working on a strange architecture uh, that doesn't implement this in a way, uh, please investigate of what your architecture might be able to uh, provide. Uh, having this be high resolution is really very important. Um, another entropy source that relates to this is what I call the, the Linus jitter dance. Um, there was some change in the RNG a couple years ago that uh, that uh, that caused boot up to fail uh, or to, to hang indefinitely. And Linus figured, well, instead of waiting for entropy to arrive, what if we could just generate it? And then uh, he made this uh, this function that uses uh, a jitter from the cycle counter um, to to generate entropy. Um, it's not quite rigorous. Uh, we, it's hard to point to any really hard science that says this definitely generates uh, good entropic data, but it's not obviously terrible. Um, uh, and so here, here's how it works is we, we take a sample from random entropy to the cycle counter, um, and then we've got a timer. And if the timer isn't currently armed, we, we, we arm it for uh, one jiffy from now. So that's just normal timer list. Um, and then, and then we, uh, we add that sample to the pool, to the entropy pool. And then we just kind of run this loop uh, until that timer has, has run 
usually 256 times if we want 256 bits of, of input. Um, but that's not 256 bits, 256 bits of iterations. That's however many iterations it takes for the timer to fire uh, that many times. So usually that winds up being 512 GIFUs worth of iterations, which is kind of a long time. Um, uh, and in the meantime, we have the scheduler jumping in uh, to service the timer request, and the, um, the timer is touching some of the same data that that loop is running. Uh, and so there's some potential uh, cache jitter between the two of them. Uh, and so maybe this is chaotic enough that this is doing something. Maybe it's complete garbage. We don't know. It's not obviously terrible, but... It's something, and as a last ditch effort uh, where we really need some entropy from somewhere, maybe this is all right. Um, but again, maybe it's not. Uh, so potential research project here to look into this or try and model it or do something. Um, but currently as a last ditch effort, it's the best we've got right now. Um, then of course in platforms that support RDC or RDRAND or instructions like that, I mean, it's, it's great. Um, uh, because it's coming from a real hardware source where we know or we hope it's good. Um, though the old code would incorporate it in a way that was kind of eyebrow raising. Um, like sometimes be giving some output stream and uh, just XOR it into it. Um, so there's a lot of kind of tinfoil hat types uh, that thought, well, like, you know, the CEO, uh, the, the, the CPU can see what your, um, what your, what the, the input is, um, it can predict, it, it can generate its own outputs for RDGRAND, so it could come up with whatever values for RDGRAND, such that when you exhort together, uh, it's something uh, that it controls, or you know, various kind of concerns like this. So uh, the new code always puts RDGRAND to the hash function. So even if the CPU is backdoored, um, it could, at the very least do nothing if RDRAND values are known ahead of time, but it's not going to be able to make things worse um, because the CPU is still unable to compute a pre-image of the hash function. Um, so on, on CPUs that uh, support this, uh, you can turn it off, of course, if you don't trust RDRAND RDC, but this allows the RNG to be initialized immediately, which is important. Uh, which brings us, um, to the principal question of the RNG at early boot time, are we initialized yet? Um, so it's important that the RNG has 256 bits of entropy before it generates output. Um, uh, if it, say, only has eight bits of entropy and then it generates a stream, then you can just kind of brute force the seed behind that stream and destroy the security of it. So we, we want there to be a lot. Um, uh, sometimes we get some physical guarantee from like a hardware random number generator, RDRAND or something, where the, the device manufacturer says this data is always going to be this entropic. Um, and if we choose to trust them, then game over, it's easy. Um, other times we don't know, like in the case of, uh, of interrupt timing or jitter or whatever, all we have are heuristics. Um, we're, we're not doing a, a physical simulation. Uh, it's unfortunate to admit, uh, but this is basically the case. We're just kind of guessing. It's maybe there's entropy here. We hope there's entropy here. We'll try and guess if it's any good. Um, and so the, the kernel RNG does uh, entropy estimation, which uh, is kind of an impossible proposition. Um, uh, Nonetheless, we have some heuristics. So we assume that 64 interrupts uh, or a second of interrupts have a one bit of entropy. Um, the disk timings um, and the, the keyboard events, the mouse events, uh, have this really old estimation algorithm where we look at the third order differentials of the timing. Uh, and maybe that's all right. It seems heuristically to give uh, decently conservative, but still non-zero results. Um, and then the, you know, as I mentioned, the hardware RNG, it's however much uh, the hardware says it has and so forth. Um, 
But again, it's an impossible proposition to, to really do this. So this is just a heuristic. It's not rigorous. Um, but also, it's only really relevant at boot time. Um, and the code that accounts the amount of entropy we have, it's actually static branched out and never used once we hit the threshold of 256 bits. Um, now, that wasn't true in the past. In the past, there was some concept of entropy being used up or entropy getting worse over time. Uh, but this is all kind of rubbish. Um, entropy never really decreases. Once we have enough, we have enough, and then we don't need to touch this code ever again. Um, and hopefully the heuristics are an underestimate uh, where we're being much too paranoid and there's way more entropy um, than we say. Um, interestingly though, the estimation introduces a side channel attack um, where you can look at how much uh, entropy is currently available uh, as it's going toward 256 bits. Um, and uh, that indicates something about its inputs because the inputs are these cycle counters and the estimation is done based on timing. And so by witnessing how fast the entropy avail file is increasing, gives you some information about what those inputs are. So you could argue that the estimation only makes things worse um, because to do it well, it's impossible. And to do it at all, you might introduce a side channel. Um, but I think there still might be practical reasons for including it that we'll talk about in a second. Um, <clears throat> um, there is a, a, a kind of a strange thing here where uh, dev you random uh, for historical reasons um, and also get random with GRND and secure flag. Uh, they have to supply bytes immediately before it's initialized. Uh, they never block. Um, and so here's an attack, which would be um, before we have enough entropy, user space uh, uh, is continually reading these. And every time a bit of entropy comes in, uh, it brute forces what that one extra bit was. And it keeps doing this over and over. It only has to brute force one bit at a time. And if it does this enough times, then it can get the whole state of the pool um, and uh, it's compromised. So actually what we do to satisfy dev you random uh, having to never block, but also this attack is we, we let the first 128 bits uh, influence the state as they come in because we want entropy uh, to be available and doing things as soon as possible during early boot. Um, but the next 128 bits we buffer. Uh, we don't add those till the very end. So at least after the RNG is initialized, uh, we have at least 128 bits uh, that weren't able to be brute forced. And of course, the amount of entropy is only ever increasing after that. Um, so let's talk about some, some threat models. Um, two things that uh, people generally care about. There's premature first, which would be, are we giving output before we've accumulated enough entropy? Um, which allows an attacker to brute force the state um, at early boot. Do we care about this? Yes, we do. You don't want to generate your SSH host keys with no entropy. This is important. Um, and so we, we consider the kernel state to be compromised uh, when it first turns on because the attacker knows it. It's all zero when the computer starts. All right, so we just call that a compromise. Um, okay, then we've got the premature next, um, which is a little more complicated. It's uh, it's maybe a more generalized version of premature first where the state of the RNG leaks. So it's compromised sometime later, uh, say by like a, some kind of info leak attack. Um, and then we give new output from the RNG uh, sometime after the leak, but um, we haven't accumulated enough new, uh, new entropy. So the attacker can brute force the state uh, the, the same way as at boot if we give it out too early. Um, question is, do we care about this? Um, and Linux kernel RNG does not, uh, which is a lot different for, from Fortuna, uh, where the Fortuna model, which is the RNG used uh, by FreeBSD, uh, by Windows kernel uh, originally, and I think recently uh, Mac does this, 
Um, the, the Fortuna model it doesn't need to count entropy. It doesn't care about estimation at all. Um, it does something with multiple buckets where it spreads things around at different rates uh, with the guarantee that eventually the RNG state will, venture, will, will recover from a compromise. Um, but Linux takes a little different approach, a uh, different argument where if the RNG state is compromised for whatever reason, the most important thing is that we start using new entropy as soon as possible, that we recover as soon as possible. It's less important that we eventually recover and more important that we, we stop uh, using bad ephemeral keys or, or whatever uh, as soon as possible. Um, especially because we don't really ever know when a compromise happens. If there's some attack, probably the kernel is not gonna know about the attack if it's done right. Um, and so if it does happen, there needs to be a recovery. Um, uh, and in general, if the, there's an info leak in the kernel and the, some attacker can read kernel memory, there's probably bigger problems to be concerned about as well. And under what attack scenarios uh, do you have where an attacker can info leak once, but he can't info leak twice? Uh, and what scenarios can you not just run the attack again? There are a couple, but I, I don't know that they're important enough to care about. Um, anyway, the lack of concern for the premature next, it goes against a lot of academic orthodoxy, but in recent discussions, it seems like a lot of the crypto community has actually come around that this is indeed the kind of more practical approach uh, and it allows us to keep the code super simple. Fortuna is very complicated to implement multiple pools and so forth. Uh, and this, what, what we have is a lot more basic and I think a, a better attack model. Um, but the basic question for the RNG to answer is when do we reseed? Um, compromise might happen. Uh, we are getting new entropy in our pools. When do we use that entropy? That's kind of the essential question that RNG has to answer. Um, currently we reseed every minute. Uh, but remember at boot time, we consider the RNG to be compromised by default because it starts at zero. So during boot, we reseed every few seconds uh, and then it exponentially works up to a minute. So uh, it's a heuristic, uh, maybe it could be improved and we can make that even faster, uh, but it seems all right for now. Um, we also reseed after hibernation um, in case you know, someone pulls your hard drive and takes the state off there or suspend for Similar concerns, or as I mentioned, for VM forks. Um, reseeding, in addition to getting whatever entropy it can that's accumulating in the pool, it always uh, adds fresh RD RAN RDCs. So platforms that have that, uh, it's, it's quite nice. Um, and in general, for this fundamental question, the, the kernel is really in the best possible position for knowing when to reseed. Um, and for knowing what the new entropic inputs are. It's the, it's the best, most important place to, to, to get this information. There's no other part of the system that can have information as precise as this. So um, user space RNGs, for example, will always uh, have worse heuristics on when to recede or where to get entropy, or it, it'll always lag behind in some important way. Um, and as random.c improves, uh, knowing when to reseed and where to get more entropic inputs is kind of the, the evolutionary aspect of the RNG. Uh, this is the thing that will hopefully be improving over time. Um, okay, five minutes. All right, so um, talk briefly about user space interfaces. Um, generally wary of adding new user space interfaces. Compatibility has to be kept forever. It's a, a big thing uh, and the current ones and kind of added uh, willy-nilly have created pain points. There's like a lot of uh, uh, CTLs that do nothing now. Uh, but what we have, the current state of them, um, get random with no flag, uh, waits for the RNG to be initialized. Uh, the GRND insecure does not. Um, dev random uh, waits also. So dev random is like the same as get random with no flags. It didn't used to be that way. There used to be some crazy thing with uh, entropy running out and uh, some uh, approximation of true random number generators. Uh, this is nonsense that's just not there anymore. Um, Dev random is like GRND insecure. It'll give out random numbers immediately without blocking, but it'll attempt to do jitter first. 
Um, I would like dev random and dev random to be the same thing. That is, I want them both to wait for initialization. Uh, but right now, uh, some platforms will still block at boot. So I'd like to be able to improve this jitter entropy thing or uh, bootloader supplied entropy or something so that we can uh, unify these at some point. But for now, uh, dev random tries to do the jitter. If it succeeds, great. Now the RNG is initialized. If it doesn't, well, it still give insecure bytes, but okay. Um, but just to emphasize again, all of those functions give the same types of bytes. There's no difference in behavior, at least after the RNG is initialized. Uh, again, there's no funky business with true RNG. It's all just output from ChaCha20. -Cha um, uh, recently, now there's no signal interruption for up to a page size chunks. So uh, there's a lot of user space code that doesn't check return values. Um, uh, um, and on various kernels, this was maybe safe, maybe not, depending on the kernel version, how big the read was. Uh, now we allow for a, a page size before getting an uh, interruption, which is nice. There's been some recent discussions about trying to accelerate uh, get random in the VDSO for glibc usage. Um, uh, I guess we probably don't have time to get into that now, but we can talk about that after. Um, but with all this, the documentation really needs to be updated. Um, so uh, hopefully I'll be sending some patches to the Linux man page project. Um, so to wrap things up, um, Last year, there's been some, some nice modernization. There's a little bit more cryptographic rigor. Uh, not quite where I want it, but we're definitely working in that direction. Uh, the code is small, so uh, uh, if you're interested in random.c, I mean, just open it and read it. It's like there's tons of comments, and I've made sure to reorganize things by section, and uh, you should be able to read top to bottom and get some understanding. Um, these boot time issues are really important. The bootloader randomness are getting good cycle counters for jitter. Uh, I'd like to work towards some way having solutions across all architectures uh, so we can just kind of get rid of this blocking on non-blocking uh, non debate. Um, a pretty neat thing is that these improvements have actually been backported to the stable kernels. Uh, so uh, most people should now be running these, uh, which fix a lot of issues we had in the past. Uh, I'll be around all week, actually, until Friday morning. Um, I'll be in the hallway. So if you have questions or ideas or weird things you want to throw at me about random.c, please find me and talk. Uh, definitely looking for new ideas, especially on the architecture front. Uh, thanks. I think we have time for maybe one question before we get started with King Huang. Any questions? Big toss here. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Okay. Um, th thanks for the great presentation. Um, it's the first time I kind of see the full details of how um, Dev Random works. Um, oops. <laughs> um, I was wondering if you know if there's any interface um, in user space to figure out where my kernel's getting its random sources from. Um, like, you know, is it seeding from my SD card or whatever else? And uh, sort of getting some insight. You. you want a user space interface to determine what? To determine wh where, is this, is, where the seeding is coming from and what's the current state of the random generator uh, in general. I mean, because like, okay. I, okay, I can get you know stuff from W random, but um. well, so right now the seeds come from all the places I mentioned, um, plus the hardware random number generator and the HWRNG thing is its own driver, and you can see what's what hardware it's using there. But for random.c, it comes from all these sources combined. Uh, and if you want to know the state, you can call get random with uh, grnd non block, uh, asking for a size of zero, and it'll return success or failure depending on whether or not it's initialized. Right, okay. But there's no sort of like way to get insight as to where currently my numbers are seeded from, I guess. I, no, I mean, th there's no real-time thing where it's going to say, ooh, got a piece of entropy here, got a piece of entropy there. And in fact, if it did too much, maybe that would even be some sort of side channel. Sure. Um, and it's just not necessary. It's all the time hashing in these cycle counters, uh, any place you can get it. Thank you. 
and another question. I think we're about out of time. Is it quick? Okay, well, find me after. I do after, afterwards. Thanks again, Jason. Sure.